Hello, my listeners. How are you doing? I hope everything in your life is beautiful. Everything is chilling and nice. As you know, the world has been disturbed because of a lot of wars. Fighting everywhere, wars here and wars there, and people are just confused as to how to survive peacefully. Peaceful coexistence has become a problem to mankind. Everybody's fighting. The Ukrainian war with Russia definitely has been intensified to a point where everybody should be involved to stop it. The world economy is just really messed up. Many people are just hungry and homeless in this uh, beautiful home we call the earth and the climate has been really polluted. Things are changing. We're not doing it right. We're not communicating as the same human being, as the same species, basically. You understand what I'm saying? We came from the same parents back, back, back in the days and now we got different colors. But yet we're fighting, we're fighting for money, for prestige, for power. And definitely, as you know, there have been G7 meetings in India, although the Chinese government didn't attend it. And in this occasion, at the time when the world has been really suffering because of unfairness, political mishap, wars, starvation, exploitation, and all that, I found myself very much impressed by his Brazilian president, who didn't even have a PhD or something. He's running for the third term. And I do believe he has a vision that I want to share. It's all about peace, ladies and gentlemen. It's about peace. Okay, let's go. Uh, Exclusive Brazil's president on first post. Okay. Come back to all of these points, the very important subjects that you touched upon. Uh, but I uh, also want to ask you, because until yesterday, uh, the European uh, and the G7 countries seemed intent on uh, having their way with the language vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine. How did you uh, and, and others prevail upon them uh, to ensure that there was consensus uh, on, on, on the declaration? Well, this is already is a majority that is being formed within the countries. On the BRICS, for example, we didn't discuss the war during the BRICS summit meetings. We thought that there's other fora to discuss the war, and we could bring to India a debate, a discussion that has uh, more consequence in Europe because they're involved directly in the war and the US is also directly involved in the war. But the other countries are not involved directly in the war. The other countries are involved in a policy for peace, to develop a policy. We have to talk about peace every day. So that's why we are already discussed with all the European heads of state and government. I discussed twice with President Biden. We do not want to discuss war. We want to discuss peace. When Putin and Zelensky are willing to discuss peace, then India will talk, Brazil will talk, uh, China will talk, Indonesia, Argentina, and other countries will go to peace conversations. We'll talk about peace. We have to stop the war first. And then diplomacy should come in the picture so that we can see the world living in peace. Would you say this consensus, in a way, is a win for New Delhi and it establishes India as a bridging power in an increasingly divided world? India will always be a power. It is a country that has a tremendous 1,000-year culture. It's a country that was already colonized, a country that managed to get its independence with the most extraordinary figure after Christ, which is Muhammad Gandhi. It's a country that has 1 billion, 400 million inhabitants. It's a country that is the sixth largest economy of the world, a country that managed to build a cheap rocket and reach a part of the moon that not even the Russians managed and the Americans managed to go to that part of the moon. So what happened here was the result of the competence of organization of the G20 that India organized as the host country. India 
is always a country that you have to take it very seriously, very respected country. And I will always say that because we came here to and we established a strategic partnership between Brazil and India. And this partnership now needs to be improved so that the trade flow, uh, foreign trade flow between Brazil and India should be the size of India and the size of Brazil. It should be very big because we can do that. So we have the conditions to do. So what happened here was a victory of the organization and of the respectability that we all have for India. You had your first meeting with Prime Minister Modi in the month of May after your inauguration as the president of Brazil for a third term. Uh, what was your impression of him and how do you see his leadership on this global platform? The impression was very good. I had previous relations here with the former Prime Minister Singh, and it was a very good relationship with Prime Minister Singh. And the relationship with the Prime Minister uh, Modi was extraordinary. The twi two times that I met him, he conveys a trust, a confidence that he's managing India with great seriousness for the good and the benefit of the Indian people. And this is of the interest of Brazil, is that we shouldn't have a relationship with a ruler that have responsibility with their people. I know that India is a complicated country because it has many religions, many different languages are spoken here. So to rule a country the size of India is much more complicated to, for me to govern Brazil that has 200 million inhabitants. So I believe that he has given a clear-cut demonstration of extraordinary. He was re-elected once already, and it seems that he's running again for office next year. As, with, as our people talk to me, he could be re-elected again. This means that this is a recognition of the people for the work that he's developing. That India was the 15th largest economy and Brazil was the 6th largest economy. Now the, India is the 6th largest and Brazil is the 12th largest economy of the world. The coup that was attempted in Brazil and an extreme right uh, rising to power made Brazil go backwards in terms of its GDP growth. Now we... Uh, the G20 agenda, India uh, and others have been pushing for the inclusion of the Global South. And today, the African Union uh, got membership of the G20. So now it is G21. How significant is this according to you? Do you think it is going to mitigate the imbalance and, and will ensure just representation of uh, developing countries on international platforms? I have been saying that 30 years ago, India and Brazil were treated as poor countries, problems more bigger than solutions for them. After that, Brazil started to be treated as third world country, and then we started to be treated as a developing country. And now we're part of the global south. That is to say, we decided to organize ourselves and to show that we want to grow, that we want our society should have a standard of living that is good, that, that should have a standard uh, health care, and with that, education. And, and so the pharmaceutical industry in India is extraordinary. We want to have a partnership with them. And so... There have been many investment here in science and technology. Brazil has to learn with India with that. We have to learn with India and invest more in science and technology. So what I believe is that India is a country that is rising. And I think that this is very important. As India managed to improve the standard of living of their people, the people starts to consume more. And when they consume more, they create more jobs. And when they create more jobs, they create more salaries. And when they create salaries, more consumption. And the gigantic wheel of the economy starts moving and everybody starts to participate in the economy. So that's why I'm very optimistic with the growth of India, as was happy with the growth in China 20, 30 years ago when it happened. And when I'm happy when Brazil's economic growth makes me happy. Too. I was in Hiroshima and... The managing director of IMF said that Brazil would not grow this year. And then I just met her here and I said to her, Brazil is not going to only grow, but Brazil will surprise the IMF. We're going to grow three times more than the forecast that the IMF thought that we would grow. So my assumption is the following. A lot of money in the hands of few means wealth concentration. 
means impoverishment. It means growth of the absolute misery and poverty and malnutrition, hunger. It means all that. This is a lot of money in the hands of few. Now, when you have few money in the hands of many, that means income distribution. That means more jobs, more consumption, more schools, more health care. You don't have to be an economist to reach this conclusion. You have to be a humanist. You just to think with your heart. The ruler cannot think only with his head, with his mind. He has to have feelings, think with feelings, think with his heart, because it depends on the government to develop the opportunities for people that did not have the chance to attend schools, that did not have the opportunity to get a good job. It is the government, the state, that should, the one that should guarantee that these people should have access to what is elementary in life and that what is written in the Bible, it's written in the Constitution, it's written in the Universal Declaration of the Human Rights. And that's all in, in written. And, and that's what the governments have to do. They have to abide to that. And so I'm very happy with the rise of India, the economic rise, and with India's participation in the International Multilateral Forum because uh, it has an important role to play. The G20 is essentially a, a forum to discuss economic issues, and China is the second largest economy in the world, and the Chinese economy is not in a very good phase right now. China is also uh, increasingly isolated politically. If you were the president of China, would you skip the G20 summit in New Delhi? Well, I don't know what is the, the litigation that may happen between China and India. I don't know what are their conflicts. If I was the president of China, I would have come to the G20 meeting. Why? Why so? Because it's very important for us to participate in these fora because we need to greet people, shake hands, look in the eye of the people's to have bilateral meetings and have direct conversations and discuss the interests of your country. Now, it's, it is. It's still a country by the strength of its economy. That's that President Xi Jinping. This is the way that democracy works. And it was very important in his participation in that summit meeting. So I'm very happy. Everybody wants to have access to pleasure, to leisure. Reversing the history, federal institutes of education between the U.S. and China. Opportunity in their life because the government, the state did not allow. Because the UN, the UN Security Council doesn't represent the political geography of today, but only of 1945. And we have a UN Security Council that are the six. So that's why that we are advocating a change in the membership of, this is what I've done in, under two terms in my previous terms in Brazil, the president, this is what I'm doing the third term in as president. My preach, my political preaching is for peace, for love, for development, and for the distribution of the benefits for all the population. Mr. President, can there be peace when... Uh one player or one member of the house that you mentioned does not respect the territorial integrity of others. You mentioned balance of power. That's a term that you also used uh, in your uh, visit to China earlier this year, which was a high profile visit. Uh, China is increasingly seen as an expansionist power in the region, <coughs> and it has uh, territorial disputes with practically all its neighbors. In your private conversations with the leadership, <coughs> do you impress upon them the need to uphold a rules-based order? Well, uh, most of the discussions could be about Indian relationship with China, of course, in this situation, because China and Russia are friends now, and India is actually a friend of Russia, but a little bit problem with China because of the border issues. So their discussion could be in a little bit out of tune with our interest uh, which concentrates in the third world in general, not only in India and then Chinese relationships as such. However, the whole thing can't be changing, can't be changing. Meaning their situation, their condition can change the whole world. 
the reason because both of them probably have to have about close to three million, three billion people, I can imagine, out of the seven. Three-sevenths of the population live in the two countries.